Okay, class, uh, let's get started. Last class, as is I think the case most days I was rushed at the end. I always have uh, a set of things I would like to talk about in a given class period and I feel like I am a little too verbose sometimes. We get to like half of them. So I, the goal last class was to talk a little bit about electromagnetic radiation and then microwave a bunch of stuff. Next thing I know, I look up at the clock, we've got like 10 minutes to microwave all my stuff. And so we rushed through it. Um, we did some cool, we saw some cool stuff, but I, I do want to revisit some of it because it's, it was, the, the point wasn't just to, hey, look, you can fry a CD in your microwave. It was to actually learn a little bit of physics. So just a quick review. We, we're, right now we're talking about what I've loosely called light. And when I say light, I mean all forms of electromagnetic radiation. That's a big mouthful electromagnetic radiation or EMR. So the thing right now you are using to look, whether you're looking at your computer screen or looking at your phone or looking at me or looking up there, the thing that's registering in the back of your eyeball is photons. That's light. Now we humans, as I've mentioned, evolved around a star that puts out most of its light in a very narrow part of the spectrum. So we have a whole electromagnetic spectrum that goes all the way from long stretched out radio waves to tiny little compact gamma rays. That, 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 that's a whole spectrum, it's a whole continuum. Our star puts out all of those. Our sun puts out all of those, but most of what our star puts out is in that little region in the middle where there's an arrow right there. You can see that's the visible spectrum. So we creatures here on the surface of the earth have grown up sensitive to that part of the spectrum. And so I have these little optical sensors. I have these little two one eighth inch holes in my head that allow photons to go in and I can perceive them. But that's what we call visible light. There's a whole spectrum. And so we kind of started way over there on the left with radio waves. We talked briefly about how radio antennas work. I just want to quickly revisit that. How actually just how radio transmission and reception works. So what we humans have figured out is that if I want to get a message from here to anywhere further than yelling distance, I can use electromagnetic waves. And so what I do is I create a device that, see I have a picture here. I, have a, I take advantage of a tank circuit. A tank circuit is this circuit that it's like, a, it's like a fish tank that charge sloshes back and forth. And by charge I mean electrons. So. Um, we all know there's these things called electrons, right? Okay. Yeah, so we, we've got electrons there, the fundamental carrier of electric charge in our universe. So these little electrons, that's what we use for electricity and stuff. We'll get more into that later. But So I take electrons, and I slosh them back and forth in this tank circuit. And it's a brilliant little device. All it is is just an inductor and a capacitor, and I can get them sloshing. And if they slosh, as they slosh back and forth, every time they accelerate, they create a changing electric field, which creates a changing magnetic field, and boom, I have a electromagnetic wave, which is a wave of changing electric and magnetic field. So a tank circuit just sloshes charges back and forth. I can put an antenna on it, and I stick that up on top of a mountain, and I get charges sloshing up and down that antenna. So here's my radio antenna. I get charges sloshing up and down this antenna, and those create electromagnetic waves at the frequency of the sloshing. So all I have to do is build my tank circuit in such a way that it sloshes however fast I want those, the frequency of those waves to be. Uh, I'm employed by 106.1 the corner maybe, and they, the, I've, I have an agreement with the FCC that my sloshes have to happen at 106.1 million times a second. So I design my tank circuit, and then off go these radio waves, and I put it on top of a mountain, and people can listen to my radio channel, my radio station, my radio show from miles and miles away. So that's how the transmission part works. The transmission part is just sloshing charges up and down, and that goes out into space. And reception goes the same way. Reception, here's my end. This is actually not a transmitter, probably. This is, I think, just a receiver. So the way this works is it just sits around with a bunch of electrons just sitting there in, that, in the antenna waiting all day long for something to push on them. And so here's, like, so much of what we're going to talk about today comes from this phenomenon that I have charged particles in here called electrons. Those charged particles can be pushed and pulled by electric fields. That's the red thing up there. So this thing right now is just sitting here and the electrons in there are just kind of doing their thing, just hanging out. 
then all of a sudden a wave comes back, what comes by, and that electric wave, the electric part of the electromagnetic wave, will push and pull on the electrons, and they'll actually start moving up and down. Right now, this radio is tuned to some uh, NPR station, 88.5 or something. It's tuned. And when you tune a radio, what you're doing is you're tuning the resonant frequency, the frequency that these things will really get going. So I, any electromagnetic wave that passes by here will jiggle the, uh, the electrons in here, but there's a particular frequency that'll really get them going. If you've ever, I hope everyone's done this, been sitting in the bathtub, and there's a certain frequency you can move back and forth, and the waves all of a sudden, next thing you know, you have one that goes like up to the ceiling, right? Everyone's done that. So you're in the, there's not, there's only a particular frequency. That system has an oscillatory frequency, has a resonant frequency. That system, based on what fluid it is and how high the water is and how big your tub is, you can't, if you were just like go back and forth like crazy, you would just make little waves. And so you'd make waves, but they wouldn't oscillate. They wouldn't, you wouldn't be at the right frequency. But when you get that, when you get your bathtub really going, if you haven't done this, you gotta go home and do it. You can really get it going, then all of a sudden, the whole, you'll get it, you'll get all, you'll get like the whole water to go up one side of the bathtub. And it'll, you can see the, the floor at one side. But if you really, or if you don't wanna do it in your tub, I don't know, take any tank of water. I mean, coffee is like walking pace, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced. So like, take a cup of coffee, and you know, just jiggle it, and it'll make little waves. But if you get it at just the right frequency, have you ever been walking, all of a sudden, like coffee shoots out of the little hole? That's what's going on. You ha you accidentally hit the resonant frequency of that system, and uh, you're like walking really carefully. But even though you were careful, all of a sudden, pling, and yeah. So anyway, any tank, anything, well, it, lots of things have resonant frequencies. So uh, when I tune my radio, I've tuned it to a particular frequency, 88.5. And so when 88.5 goes by, that's what really gets going. All frequencies will get going a little, just like shaking a coffee cup will always make it move, but if you hit that resonant frequency, it'll really get going. So that's what's going on in here right now. This is tuned to 88.5, and I can listen to radios, radio waves. So that's pretty much all you need to know about radios. I wanted, wait, where's my picture? There. I wanted to try that real quick. So. Um, yeah, just to show, show you how that works. So again, the, the quick thing, and I think this is on the homework to know, is that it's the accelerating of the charges that makes the electromagnetic wave go out. And so what I can do is I can actually turn this thing on. Let's see if, I, if you can hear me. That's called static. I think we know that. So that's, that's just random noise. That's just random electromagnetic radiation. So it's tuned to 88.5. It's tuned to 88.5, but 88.5 is not in this room right now, so it's just static. And if I put that up, if I put that up to this wire right here, I think you can see when I turn the light bulb on, you can hear, you can hear electromagnetic waves. So every time you flip on a light switch, you're accelerating charges, you're letting charges go through a circuit. That creates electromagnetic waves. So you're creating radio waves just by charges going through this. This is just a nice simple circuit, car battery hooked up to a light bulb. I can get charges going in there and when it's once they're going um next time you next time you're on your way to go skiing at snowshoe Instead of taking a left, take a right and go to Green Bank um, Radio Observatory. It's right up there by Snowshoe. And so they've put this radio observatory up on a mountain, like they usually do, to get away from other sources of radiation. So I've mentioned before that when we humans want to look out into space, we, we're not confined just to the visible part of the spectrum. And maybe this is now a good time to review that part of the conversation, that if I want to see what's out in space, if I were to, if I were to restrict my looking to just the visible part of the spectrum, that'd be crazy. Because there's probably stuff coming from space that is not in the visible part of the spectrum. And so I can look out into space using radio waves. I can be looking at ra radio waves. So we, we humans have built these radio astronomy, or radio telescopes, and so there's one in West Virginia, and it's a radio telescope. It just listens all day long to radio signals coming from space. No different. So if I point a normal telescope, I'm looking at visible photons. I can build other types of telescopes. And so we have telescopes that listen to the radio part of the spectrum. 
So we've got this big radio telescope out there. And then you, if you get very close to the Green Bank Observatory, there'll be, there'll be a sign that says no internal combustion engines past this point. And the reason for that is you're, the way, you're most, the way uh, most cars work is you spray a, f a gas, you spray a vapor of gasoline into a chamber, and you light it with a spark plug. Well, that spark plug, every time that spark happens, emits radio waves. And the, the antenna up there is sensitive enough, it'll pick that up. And so you, you'll be creating extra noise for the radio guys, just the spark inside your engine. I mean, it's a tiny spark, and it's inside your car, inside an engine. But the, their, their instruments are sensitive enough that that sparking creates noise, and they're sitting there going, ah, somebody didn't read the sign again. So um, they just drive little golf carts and stuff around their around their uh, campus there. Okay. Let's see. And the last thing before we leave radio waves. So we're gonna just kind of move along the spectrum here. Before we leave radio waves, if you've ever seen the movie Contact, there's an interesting idea embedded in sort of in the beginning. I think it was in the beginning of that movie that any species in this universe has pro if they're intelligent, they've probably figured out this communicating via electromagnetic waves thing. So any intelligent species, we kind of, at least the search for extraterrestrial life, SETI, uh, kind of goes on this premise, the idea that if, if, if there's intelligent species out there, they probably have figured out, hey, we can talk using electromagnetic radiation. And so say there's some planet far away and they've, they're either talking or you know they're watching TV or they're talking on the cell phone, whatever. Those signals kind of go out at the speed of light away from our planet. And so if you were if you are 50 light years from Earth, right now you could be listening to what was going on 50 years ago. Like, what is that? That's like 65. Yeah, some really old TV. You know, listen to, I don't know, uh, Leave it to Beaver or something. So if you're 50 light years from Earth and you're an alien species, you could be, oh, those guys really like Walt and Beaver or whatever. It's really nice. Same says. I don't know. I wasn't watching TV back then. Okay. So there's the idea that that's maybe how we will. Uh, detect extraterrestrial life is their own communication will eventually get to us. The sad, lonely part of that story is nobody is that close. So uh, by the time our waves get anywhere where there might actually be life, we'll be gone, I'm sure. So um, yeah, 50 light years from now, there's nothing. So right now, I mean, we've only been doing, we've only noisy, we've only been noisy in that part of the spectrum. You know, we've only been communicating for, I don't know, like 100 years, and 100 light years away is not very far. No one is probably listening. Not to be a bummer, but uh, there it is. Um, we're alone. Um, <laughs> let's talk about microwaves. Uh, real quick, uh, a really quick review. I I don't know how much to assume about your prior knowledge of science. So you know, there's these things called atoms. You and I are made of atoms. Everything's made of atoms. Okay. Uh, atoms have positive, positively charged nuclei, protons and neutrons all in the middle, electrons flying around. Okay. Um, I think that's that should be reviewed for everyone. Uh, and I think we know, I hopefully our chemistry teacher told us, that this planetary looking model is actually just a pretty bad, eh, it's, it's a slightly misleading approximation. And hopefully your chemistry teacher told you that electrons hang out in clouds, not little discrete orbitals, or discrete little orbits like that. So uh, the other day when I mentioned that when you get down to the fundamental level, everything is really waves. Like photons, they're waves. They're not little discrete chunks. Electrons are in that category. Electrons aren't discrete little chunks like I've drawn here. Electrons are waves. But this is a useful model, the orbital model, the planetary model. It's a useful model to, to illustrate a couple things. One, there's a positively charged nucleus. The protons and neutrons in the middle create a positively charged nucleus. Two, the outside is negatively charged. Those little guys on the outside are negatively charged and they exist at certain levels. That's my favorite thing, at least the most important thing for us right now in this picture, is the electrons hang out at certain levels. The ones on the outside are the most energetic. They're the ones on the outside are the most energetic. They're also the ones responsible, usually, for bonding to other atoms. So here's a picture of a atom. Here's a picture of oh, the same, bunch, the same atom where I've labeled the outer Electrons with a V, that those are valence electrons. The only reason you need to know that is when I take a bunch of atoms, put them together, I have a bulk of material like metal. So let's say that's aluminum or steel or something. So here's how aluminum or steel or any metallic structure works. I get, all, I get a whole bunch of aluminum atoms together, and now I have a chunk of aluminum. 
And that chunk of aluminum can really be thought of a lattice of positively charged nuclei. So all the, all the nuclei are just like a big lattice. And then through that, swimming these valence electrons. So you can see in that picture, all the valence electrons, they don't really have any particular affinity or allegiance or loyalty to their parent nucleus. Really, a chunk of aluminum can be thought of just as a bunch of positive aluminum ions with electrons just swimming around. And here's why that's relative to us. That's a pretty good picture of any metal. That's a pretty good picture of steel, gold, aluminum, whatever. The reason that's relevant to us is when I send that guy through, those red waves are going to push and pull on the electrons. So every everything we're about to fry up here, yeah, every, just, just about everything we're going to fry up here, that's what's going on. Or at least any metal we're going to fry up here, that's what's going on. So I've got, for example, I have a CD. So if I were to fry the CD, here's what's going on in the CD, and I rushed through this last class. CDs are coated with a, a, a metallic surface. We might get into this. The reason for that is you sh the, re the way you read a CD is you shoot a laser at it. You don't want the laser going all the way through, so you put a reflective surface on it. So I've got a nice reflective surface. That's metallic. So what, what's going on in, this in, the, in the silvery part of the CD is a bunch of free mobile electrons. All those black Vs up there, they're very free and mobile. So when I send an electromagnetic wave through them, they are very susceptible to getting yanked around. And so that's what's going to happen. I'm going to send this wave through there. They're going to get yanked around. Now, because the CD is cut into tracks, they're going to actually run around in a pattern. They're going to run around in circles. And so as I nudge them, they're going to run around in little circles. As they do that, something that I think has come up at some other point this year, is they're going to bump into stuff. When you get molecular bumping, we, out on the macro scale, we call that hot. So anything, when you, if you want to heat something up, really what you're doing is you're getting the molecules jiggling around. So if I want to heat something up, I get the molecules jiggling. Here's one way I can get the molecules jiggling. Run electrons around, push them around with one of those waves. As they run around, they bump into stuff. They start frying the metallic surface. The metallic surface is very, very thin, so it gets hot. It starts cooking, and it starts vaporizing, and then I get gaps in there. And that's when the fun part starts. The fun part is when the, those gaps show up. The electrons want so badly to keep running around They'll jump across the gaps. That's called arcing, and that creates light. So that's kind of a complicated story. And that maybe now is a good time to mention one other part of that story that we need to know. That is this part of the story, not that part. That part of the story. The next part of the story we need to know is that, so I've, I've drawn these electrons at different levels. That's because act that's how they actually are. They are at different levels. If you want an electron to jump up a level, those levels are go up in energy. So you need more energy to go up a level. Here's the most common way to give an electron some energy. Shoot a photon at it. And so I've got a photon there on the left that's at the first orbital. The kinda, on the left, the electron just up above the nucleus. That's at the bottom level. It's at its lowest energy state. I can shoot a photon. A photon is a little packet of energy. I can shoot a photon in there, and that electron will jump up to the next energy level. And that's great. Now I've just got an energetic electron. But what's interesting is when it jumps back down, it'll shoot that photon back out, or it'll shoot a photon out. And the wavelength of the photon will depend on the, how much energy dropped, how much energy jumped. So here's one way to make light. That's how LEDs make light. Here's one way to make light. Get some electrons excited. And when they jump back down, they'll shoot out a photon of a very particular wavelength and color. And so that's what's going on in here. When I wa what happens is I get electrons jumping across the gaps. That excites the air molecule. Those air molecules get excited. And when they get unexcited, they shoot out a photon, and it's visible. So it's a pretty complicated little game that's going on in here. I wanted to make sure we took the time to understand it's not just, hey, let's fry a CD. I've got, I've got a metallic surface. I'm going to push on it. That pushing is going to get electrons running around. Those electrons running around are going to get hot. That heat's going to fry the metal. The metal's going to vaporize, make gaps. The electrons will then jump across the gaps. They'll excite the air. The air will glow in the visible part of the spectrum. That's a lot, but that's what's going on, and it's kind of cool. Let's, let's cook one. So let's see. If I go to, let's do 
two sides of the screw. That guy. So, goodbye CD. Let's go 10 seconds. And the light's off in there, so any light you see in there is being generated by the CD. And a couple things to watch for. Initially, the electrons will run around, they won't be visible. What you will be able to see is when they have cooked some of the surface. Actually, let's do like 20 seconds. I want to get it really hot. Um, once they've cooked some of the metal, they'll start jumping. And that does, the arcing you'll see, the sparking, is electrons literally jumping across the gap. So you can see the circular pattern. It's on fire. All right. That's, that's hot enough. I, that's hot enough. OK. I don't think there's a, yeah. So that's hot enough. Um, that's hot enough. It's, it's bending. I, you can see that, right? OK. So it's, yeah, it was just, it's hot. It's, um, OK. So there. You can see that, that bent. I'll leave it up here. You can play with it later. But um, if you do look at this later, you'll see, first of all, the circular pattern, the electrons were running around creating that circular pattern. And then you'll see where it started literally just cooking from the heat generated by all that. So the heat was not your typical microwave heat, which we're going to talk about. The heat was actually from the electricity running around in the circuit, which is not how you normally cook food. Normally, like I put a chicken in there, I'm not like, there's not electric circuits running around in the chicken. There's a different process, which we'll talk about in a second. All right. Um, Let's see. So, th okay, that was just me using these waves, using these waves to push and pull on, uh, push and pull on the, the 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 metal. And what I said last time was, I can take another metallic object, this ball, and I can put it in there. So there's a nice metal ball, and I'm not going to get. It's not going to get hot. It's not going to spark. It's not going to get hot because electrons are just running around. They've got plenty of room. They can run around there, no big deal. And there's not going to spark because there's, there's nothing for them to spark across. There's no jumping they have to do. They just ran around in there. They probably created a little heat. Yeah, that's actually not hot at all. And so that was in there only 10 seconds. I could, eventually, I could get it hot. But so in order to get things hot, certain thing has to, a couple, you know, just specific things have, have to occur. Uh, maybe let's do a, that might be enough. Um, maybe we'll do the plasma really quick again to see if I can do it. Um, that took a few tries last time. And the, the pla what I want you to know about the plasma is it's a similar deal. Again, I'm sending in these waves that are pushing and pulling on charged particles. But instead of relying on metal for my charged particles, the way I made charged particles was by lighting a match and then when it went out. When that match went out, there were charged particles as a smoke in the, above, in, in the beaker. So now I have a little cloud of charged particles. Rather than a CD of charged particles, I have a little cloud of charged particles. I can send a wave in there, and I can start pushing and pulling on those charged particles. And the, a similar thing happens. I get, I get excited gas in there. And so what's happening is the gas gets excited by the electrons running around. And then when I, I get excited gas, and then when the, when the gas molecules fall back down in energy level, they spit out a photon. And the, one of the reasons I want to try this again today is that if we do it right, you might see it go through two colors. That's what we're going to try to see. And so the color is, which we've seen that we've seen, like, uh, let's get this picture back. The color is dependent on the, on the wavelength. And so if I'm seeing yellow, I'm seeing one wavelength. If I'm seeing blue or red or something, I'm seeing a different wavelength. The wavelength depends on the energy gap. And the energy gap depends on what gas and how excited. And so what, if I'm lucky, what will happen is initially something further to the left will I'll get, we'll get, we'll start seeing. So maybe we'll start seeing yellow or orange. But then maybe I'll leave it in there long enough. I don't want to blow up the beaker. But if I leave it in there long enough, I might get even more excited gas, and the, the energy drop will be even bigger, and I might get blue or purple. So let's try that a little bit. Just we'll try it a couple times. So remember, it took me a few tries. Oh, this one's already on here. Maybe I'll stick two in there. There we go. So you can see there's some smoke coming off there. That's, that's going to be my source of particles. But I 
do need enough smoke to accumulate. That beaker's pretty big, so I need enough smoke to accumulate in there that I can I can ionize it and get it going. Um, what I might do is I might just start might stick more matches in there. Let's just do that. There we go. So let's see what color. So I think that was pretty awesome. So I think that went through a couple of colors. And so um, what, what, what's mainly in there, I think, is excited carbon is my gas in there. And then I can get that to go through a couple different energy levels and see some different colors. Pretty cool. OK. Let's do a couple more things with microwaves. Yeah, let's do a couple more things with microwaves, and then we're going to start moving to the visible part of the spectrum. That would be next, I guess. Yeah, well, we'll talk about infrared. OK, but let's talk a little bit more about microwaves. Um, first of all, I want to see their size. And so, oh, that's an eye clicker. Let's do an eye clicker. The eye clicker of the day is, I'm going to send these microwaves in there. How big are they? Crazy small, because they're photons. About a millimeter. It's like the width of a match. Eh, smaller than that. About 10 centimeters, or about a kilometer, because they're crazy fast or something. So um, give that one a shot. And uh, by the way, I'm talking about the microwaves that are in the oven. Uh, Microwave, oh, I guess the answer's been on the board half the day, but um, microwave is a, is a, is a that, that encompasses a fair, fairly wide range of photons. I'm talking about the ones in that box right there, in, the, in your microwave oven. I don't know if that changes your, your answer at all. Take five more seconds. Let's see. So let's see. Uh, the chart I've been using for the last 33 minutes has said one centimeter. Was that even an option? That wasn't even an option. So it's B or C, probably. Let's measure them. And here's how we're going to measure them. I'm going to hit stop on this. OK, ready? Everyone buzz in. OK, so I don't know the answer. Let's measure them. Here's the answer, or here's how we're going to measure them. Here is my array of microwave detecting devices. I don't know if you can see these. This is, these are microwave detectors. And they're delicious. They are they're Easter colored uh, marshmallows from Harris Teeter. Um, somehow that's Easter colors. But what we're going to do is we're going to put these in the microwave, and hopefully they will they have they will do some detecting for me. They will show me how big my microwaves are. So. So we're going to try. We're going to see if we can detect a little bit. So what I'm hoping is we. These things are electromagnetic waves. There's something in marshmallows, which we'll talk about in a second, that will respond to electromagnetic waves. And we still haven't talked about why cell phones aren't going to kill you. We need to do that too. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's something in there that will detect them. And what we what I hope to see is actually like a little sine wave show up in there that we can actually measure. And let's give it a try. I'll just. Uh, See, 
So um, something, will get, something in there should respond to the electromagnet electromagnetic waves and create, probably turn uh, water into water vapor and create a gas. Are we seeing motion in there? Yeah. And I, I should get a, some expansion. So what I'd like to see, what I'd like to see is literally a wave. In other words, like I'd like to see two nodes. Let's try that again. I think we're seeing them, sort of. I'm going to open the door real fast and see if there's a waveform in there. Ready to go. <laughs> sure. I can pretend that I'm seeing a wave there. It, anyway, uh, if you do the math, um, and here's the very complicated math that I've, I've mentioned before. Uh, if you do the math, wavelength is that lambda there. That's lowercase lambda. That's just speed of light divided by your frequency. So if I take the speed of light about 300 million meters per second and divide by the frequency of my microwave, which is 2.4 gigahertz, I get about 12 centimeters. I get about yay big. So the answer I was shooting for was 10 centimeters, because it's roughly 12. So the microwave encompasses a pretty broad range, as we've seen. Uh, but the microwaves in your oven are of a specific type, and they are of the 2.4 gigahertz type, and that's about 12 centimeters if you do the math. Okay. Speaking of microwaves and 2.4 gigahertz, uh, let's really quick talk about what a microwave is actually doing and if that's bad for you. So here's what a microwave is actually doing. Here's the brilliant thing that microwave scientists figured out whenever they figured this out, microwave cooking thing. So I can send an electromagnetic wave. I can stick anything in the microwave, put my coffee cup in there. And it's going to send electromagnetic waves in there. As we saw with the metal ball, a lot of times that doesn't do squat. If you, on a dry day, put a paper plate in a microwave and cook it for a minute, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to get hot. If you put uh, most uh, microwave-safe coffee mugs, if you put an empty coffee mug in the microwave and microwave it for a few seconds, it's not going to get hot. Because what is happening is you're sending electromagnetic waves through. That's not, that's not really that big a deal. Because I mean, right now, radio waves and cell phone signals and every other type of electromagnetic wave is passing through your body right now. It's not cooking you. So by, that, by themselves, just sending electromagnetic waves through something is not going to get it hot. Here's what happens. And I don't have a picture. Water molecules, you might remember from chemistry class, are polar. Water molecules are polar, meaning when H2O get together, when you get two H's and an O together, the resulting little molecule is not have a, does not have an even distribution of charge. The electrons hang out over here a little bit more than they hang out over here. So I get a polar molecule. I get something that has more negative on one side than it is on the other side. So when I send that electromagnetic wave through, it'll actually pull on the polar molecule. It'll add a little bit of a torque to the polar molecule. Then one 2.4 billionth of a second later, it was just pulling. Now it's going to push. Then it's going to pull. It's going to push. It's going to pull. 2.4 billion times a second, every water molecule in your, in your micro, in whatever's in your microwave gets a little uh, 2.4 billion times a second, it gets a pull and a push, a pull and a push, pull and a push. Just the water, because it's polar. If I put steel in there, it's not, that's not going to happen. I can put lots of things. I can put ceramic in there. I can put paper in there. It's not going to do it. It's just the water. So if I want to cook something, think about everything you've ever cooked in a microwave. Coffee or tea gets hot because it's mostly water. Chicken or turkey or cheese has a lot of water. Microwaves have or marshmallows have water. So anything with water in it is going to get hot because of the pushing or pulling. Now, if you've ever taken a burrito that is frozen solid, you forgot about it, it's been in the freezer for like a year, then you put it in the microwave, and you, you can cook it for like five minutes, you pull it out. One part of that burrito is lava hot, and the rest is still frozen solid, right? That's because what's going on in there is that your burrito is frozen solid. The water is now locked in solid ice. It's not liquid. It can't jiggle. And so those microwaves go in there, and they, the, the water is frozen in place, and it doesn't jiggle. It doesn't get hot. However, one little spot somewhere in that burrito, some water will turn back into liquid, and it'll start jiggling. And it'll jiggle like crazy because it's in there for five minutes. And it'll jiggle its neighbors, and it'll jiggle its neighbors. And all of a sudden, you'll have this one spot that's lava hot while the rest is still frozen. 
So most microwaves have a defrost setting. And what the defrost setting is, you hit defrost. It's nothing fancy. All it, all, here's what all the defrost does. It turns it on and turns it off for a second. So you say defrost for 10 minutes. It'll turn it on high for 60 seconds or something. You'll, you can usually hear it. You can, usually, you can usually, usually hear it kick off for a little bit and then kick back on and kick off. So what it's doing is it's hoping that somewhere in that burrito there is something liquid. And it'll grab that and heat it like crazy for a minute. Then it'll stop and let that heat dissipate by conduction, by actual just bumping its neighbors. Then it'll turn back on. Now hopefully we have some new guys that have been defrosted by their neighbors. Turn back on and cook them. And then it'll turn off and let them warm their neighbors up. Then it'll turn on again. So what it's doing is it's just hoping to grab some, wherever there's some liquid, get it hot, and then let that heat diffuse through the burrito or the hot pocket or whatever. And so that's in contrast to when you just put something in a normal oven or like a toaster oven, the way a normal oven or a toaster oven works, it's just bombarding the outside with photons and trying to get the outside hot. So you put a frozen bagel in your toaster oven, the outside will get hot and the inside will still be frozen. The reason is all, all the normal oven can do is just get an element really hot and that element gets hot enough that it just starts shooting out photons and those photons bump into the surface. And so that's a totally different way of cooking. You're cooking from the surface in as opposed to jiggling water. The one other way I've cooked something in a, in a microwave is whenever, I mean you guys are in college, I'm sure we all eat Hot Pockets all the time, right? Uh, so the way you make, if you've ever put a, if you ever, if you ever cooked a Hot Pocket, Step one was remove the, the thing from the plastic sleeve, right? Step two was insert Hot Pocket in special cooking sleeve, right? Hopefully everyone's done that. They, they come with this high-tech special cooking sleeve. That's actually metal. And the reason is, if the Hot Pocket is what they are trying, if it has a nice flaky crust, the definition, another word for flaky is not water, it's dry. And so the, the crust is supposed to be dry, flaky. So you can microwave that all day long, it's gonna stay cold because there's no water to jiggle. So the other way it heats is you put it in a metal sleeve and it's smooth metal, so it won't spark, but you will get electric current running through that metal sleeve and it'll actually cook a little bit more like a traditional oven. So that metal is actually getting hot from the, elect from the electromagnetic waves pushing electrons in a little current. So when you do a hot pocket, you put it in the sleeve, you're doing microwave cooking, but you're also doing a little bit more conventional cooking by making little, by making little current. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Where are we going to go next? We're going to go to infrared, right? Is there anything else I need to cook? I think that's it about microwaves. Um, oh, and by the way, here's a piece of chocolate that we cooked earlier, trying to also see that 12 centimeter. This is maybe a little more visible. I don't even know if I'm on camera. Uh, let's see. Side. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that. Anyway, that's about, that should be 12 centimeters. So we just stuck a chocolate bar in the microwave until it got really cooked. And there were, this is where the hot spots were. So in a microwave like that, I guess I should say that there, you're going to get hot spots because you're going to get this nice interference pattern. Yes. Good question. Yeah, I mentioned dead zones. Here's my dead zone where it's not getting cooked. Here's my two not dead zones where it is getting cooked. And I don't think, yeah, I didn't explain that well, very well, that um, what's going on is I've got my microwave in a box. My microwave's in a, all my microwaves are in a box, and so I'm setting up a pattern that exists in there. And at some places I'm getting, I think I mentioned this last class, I'm getting destructive interference. I'm getting destructive interference, meaning I'm, there's spots where, a, where the wave pattern that's in there, it's kind of like that interference pattern we saw the other day with the laser. There's spots where, a wave crest and a wave trough are canceling each other out. And so if you've ever, uh, if you've ever uh, been driving your car and come to a stoplight and all of a sudden your FM is really bad, I don't know if you've ever seen that. You're like, yeah, it happens to me all the time. I don't know. I'm always in the worst spot at a stoplight. So all of a sudden, you're, whatever radio station you're listen to, listening to just gets kind of staticky. You can usually roll your car forward or back a couple inches and it'll get better. And I grew up thinking it's because so in order to roll my car forward or back, I had to rev it, and revving it like got it extra juice or something. No, it's really, it's I happened to just be sitting in a dead zone where there was destructive interference. So uh, the radio waves were bouncing off the car next to me and bouncing off my hood and bouncing off the floor, and I, I was just in a spot where everything was canceling out. So a dead zone is a place where you get destructive interference. Okay. We have four minutes left. I did also want to mention... Uh, 
most microwaves have a window so you can see you're cooking, but you don't want a window in a microwave because you're going to cook yourself. So the, what most microwaves have is a screen, a mesh. And I think everyone's seen that, that it most, almost every microwave you've ever looked at has a mesh. And that mesh is interesting because I don't want microwaves getting out. But if my, mic if my holes in my mesh are smaller than the wavelength, approximately, smaller than the wavelength, then the waves actually can't get out, even though there's holes. And it's a little complicated, but a, a very short wavelength a very short wavelength, like uh, you know, a gamma ray or something, will be able to get out of that hole. But a long microwave, microwaves are about you know, 12 centimeters long. A nice long microwave, as it passes through, it takes so long to pass through that hole that the electrons around that hole can actually reorganize and effectively cancel out the electric wave. So the electrons reorganize as the wave comes by, and they basically cancel it out. And the, the door is just as reflective as the rest of the box. That box is a big reflective cavity, and it's reflecting off the metal sides, and it's also reflecting off that mesh. And, so, and the reason for that is because the holes are much smaller than the wavelength. OK, two minutes left. I, I got to say this because I keep forgetting. We've been talking about microwaves. Your cell phone, I swear, uses microwaves to communicate. Here's the difference. Your cell phone, when you hold it up to your ear, is talking to a tower two miles away using microwaves, the same stuff used to boil coffee. So that should be disconcerting. It should. And your cell phone doesn't know where the tower is, so it's blasting an omnidirectional wave. So you, there's no way to hold the phone and it won't go through your skull, because it's just blasting it out every direction. So your phone, I promise, is sending waves, the same exact waves that cook your coffee and can cook a Hot Pocket, through your skull. That should be disconcerting. So you don't want to carry it in your pocket all day long. You don't want to hold it up to your head all day long. The, the jury is still out. The data is still coming in. We haven't, humans haven't had cell phones long enough to really know 100-year-long you know, longitudinal studies. But the data is coming in and saying there probably is effect. Here's the effect. If you look at the spectrum, microwaves are on the low energy side. If, if it was just the energy that was scary, we should be scared of visible light. Visible light is more energetic than microwaves. But you and I are made of mostly water. And so when I hold a phone up to my head, it'll jiggle the water just like it jiggles the water in my coffee. Here's my only hope. My hope is that the amount of jiggling is enough, is little enough, that when I take the phone back away from my head, my head cools off. But every time you hold your head up, hold your phone up to your ear, you're actually warming up your brain and your eyeball and your jaw and whatever else you're going to hold it up to. A tiny, tiny, almost immeasurable bit, but the fact that that's happening should eh, make you a little bit worried. So I know you don't sleep with it under your head or anything like that, I think would be the public service announcement. That your brain is going to get a little better. The FCC or somebody has dictated there's a certain amount of energy that the human body can uh, dissipate. So as long as cell phones emit less than that, we're all going to be fine. But just, just, just the constant heating and cooling, heating and cooling, I don't know. I, I try to use the, the earbuds. Okay, uh, see you Monday.